I'd like to talk about Anton Webern and his piece Drei Lieder, Opus 18, Three Songs, Opus 18, for a soprano, E-flat clarinet, and guitar. Uh, Webern is a composer that has been enormously talked about and discussed and studied and performed, um, but the, the three songs, Opus 18, remain a relatively uh, seldom performed piece. Um, I'm going to look at some of the reasons for that, but I'd also like to just discuss this piece uh, in the context of Webern's overall work and uh, see what the particularities of this work are, because I think it's a, an extremely fascinating piece. So we'll start off just with a very quick uh, biographical sketch of Webern. So he was an Austrian composer uh, born in 1883, and he was killed in 1945 by an American soldier by accident, apparently, although the circumstances of his death remain somewhat um, uh, controversial. Um, and he was uh, a pioneer of extremely radical new composition techniques. And uh, Webern is a very interesting figure because he started out in his career writing basically late romantic music, um, extremely expressive, intense, uh, lyrical uh, music. But from the very beginning, he had a tendency to express himself in an extremely compact, um, condensed manner. And even in his uh, tonal pieces, his very earliest uh, pieces written in, a, in this sort of late romantic idiom, um, you can see that Webern is sort of struggling to develop his ideas. It doesn't really come naturally to him, and it's not really his native form of expression in a certain sense. And um, after this initial period, which basically was his student period, except for the first couple of opus numbers, uh, when he's writing tonal music, um, he eventually has uh, the insight that um, perhaps the the key signature um, that was a, a feature of Western art music for centuries was basically no longer relevant whatsoever to his practice. And um, this is something that was pioneered by his teacher, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, who started writing uh, atonal pieces. In other words, uh, pieces that uh, have no tonal center whatsoever, they don't have a key signature, they don't have uh, tonic and dominant polarities, they basically uh, allow the composer to pretty much write any notes that he or she wishes in any order whatsoever. And uh, this was an extremely interesting period historically because for the first time there was no real hierarchy, there was no real particular uh, technical method for dealing with this uh, extraordinary amount of freedom that composers who were writing in this style suddenly had. So it was extremely difficult and challenging for Weber and for Schoenberg to navigate this crisis. Now what's interesting is that you still do see the sort of general shape, the general outline of, of romantic uh, gestures uh, in this music. So even if the the harmonic uh, and melodic language is, uh, is very different. These are still composers that are coming out of and completely steeped in the, uh, the sort of uh, Germanic uh, musical tradition. So it's not completely alien, but uh, it certainly goes uh, uh, a long way there. So um, uh, I mentioned Arnold Schoenberg and uh, Schoenberg and Webern along with uh, Webern's uh, a close contemporary, Alain Berg, who was born two years after Webern in 1885. Uh, these form the three composers of what is commonly known as the Second Viennese School. The First Viennese School being the sort of classical masters like uh, uh, Schubert and Mozart. So the Second Viennese School uh, were uh, uh, basically a group of extremely radical composers devoted to uh, experimentation, but also not really seeing themselves as radicals. They, they felt that they were sort of um, carrying on the natural extension of the Germanic tradition. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually very interesting that, uh, that they would feel this way because uh, they profoundly upset the, the musical order of their time, while at the same time claiming to be in the heritage of uh, their immediate forebears, uh, particularly Mahler, for example, but also Richard Strauss, and, uh, but also Brahms, uh, uh, Wagner, all of these sort of late romantic uh, figures. Um, so Webern was a very marginal figure in his lifetime. He was certainly 
uh, known and had a certain notoriety, but he wasn't performed very often. He had a very, very difficult time making his living. Uh, basically, uh, alternated between uh, teaching privately, for the most part, um, getting the occasional commission, and, uh, and conducting, although um, as he got into his 40s and 50s, he had less and less work of this nature, and certainly the, the, the World Wars made it very, very complicated for him to make a living. And this was not helped at all by his uncompromising uh, musical vision, of course, which uh, resulted in him being shunned and mocked and, uh, and maligned in all sorts of ways during his lifetime. So this was not a sound uh, um, uh, vocational uh, choice that Webern made in deciding to write this way, but he had such a, uh, an unbending conviction that this was the only way that he could do it, and this was the only sort of uh, logical extension of, of uh, Germanic musical history. Uh, all of these composers had a profound sense of their own historicity and a sense of their place in history, the sense of the, 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 the significance of their actions and the consequences that this would have for future generations. Uh, but in fact, Webern was actually completely correct in the sense that um, the generation of composers that came immediately after him, very, very shortly after his death actually, starting in the late 1940s, um, were profoundly, profoundly influenced by him. In fact, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the entire 20th century, well, not the entire 20th century, but after the, certainly the post-war period, would have been utterly different had it not been for Weber. And not only did he influence the, the sort of the, the next generation of composers, so that would be people like uh, Boulez and Stockhausen, Luigi Nono, uh, Moderna, and so on, but also the, the several generations that came after that. And you could certainly make the claim that uh, today's composers are still, to a certain degree, uh, under the influence of Webern, whether they realize it or not, because so many aspects of his music have simply become absorbed. Um, so I want to look at this particular work, Opus 18, which is a very eccentric work, even by Webern standards, with a, a very unusual instrumentation. Um, so writing a trio for a soprano, E-flat clarinet, and guitar was by no means a normal thing to do then or at any time previously, and nor would it be today, um, partly because uh, it's a kind of unbalanced ensemble, the soprano will tend to drown out the other instruments, particularly the guitar, which is not as uh, not as uh, strong, doesn't have as much carrying power as the as the voice or even the clarinet would have. Um, so we might ask ourselves, well, why on earth would you write a piece for this particular combination of instruments? And I think the answer is that Webern was profoundly influenced by Mahler, and uh, Mahler made actually frequent and very characteristic use of the E-flat clarinet in his symphonies. The E-flat clarinet is the sort of uh, the higher pitched uh, little brother of the regular B-flat and A clarinets. Uh, it's a very interesting instrument, very sort of uh, very clear, somewhat strident tone quality. Um, it can play very, very high, and it's, uh, it's often associated with military music. In fact, it was probably invented uh, for uh, military purposes, actually, as a, as a kind of uh, uh, an excellent outdoor instrument because it has such a, a piercing uh, tone quality. So it's very good for marching bands. And this sort of uh, tonal characteristic of it was seized upon by Mahler and other composers of that period, who were constantly looking for novel tone colors. Uh, the presence of the guitar in the ensemble uh, is also worth noting uh, this was not an instrument that was commonly used in chamber music formations at the time. Um, and uh, I think that along with the E-flat clarinet, Webern's choice of these two instruments, well, besides the fact that Mahler used both of them, there's actually a guitar part in Mahler's Seventh Symphony, I think that both instruments for him uh, sort of brought to mind outdoor music, folk music. They had a kind of a rural quality that I think appealed to him. This was a, an aspect of his nature that, that ran very, very deep. And it's, it's interesting to point out that no matter how sophisticated and complex Webern's music became, uh, it always had a kind of naive, folk-like underpinning to it. And this, this piece is no exception. So my sense is that the 
the combination of soprano, E flat clarinet, and guitar is basically just a reference to folk music, and it's almost as though you were sort of walking into a, a tavern in some some small town somewhere in rural Europe, and there were these performers who were just making music on whatever instruments they happened to be able to find. And uh, there's a kind of ad hoc, uh, spontaneous quality to this particular uh, group of, uh, of timbres that I, I find quite interesting. As far as we know, the piece was not performed during Webern's lifetime. It's not clear uh, who he wrote it for or why he wrote it, except uh, to respond to a, an inner necessity. Um, the other thing I find interesting about this is that the, uh, the soprano part is unbelievably difficult to sing. Um, it leaps all over the place uh, from the very highest register to the very low register from note to note basically. Uh, it never really stays anywhere for longer than one or two notes at the most. Um, so it requires uh, a soprano with an extremely flexible virtuosic voice. And even today, even for the, the very best sopranos, this, this remains an unbelievably difficult piece to play. And I'm sure that at the time, in 1925, there was just simply nobody who could navigate such a piece. I mean, the, the, the sort of singing that it calls for, that technique simply had not been developed yet. Singers did not know how to sing uh, atonal music with no pitch center whatsoever, leaping all over the place. Uh, it just would have been, I'm sure, completely impossible from a technical point of view. So. Um, Webern probably wasn't thinking in terms of advancing his career when he wrote this piece, and uh, I can't imagine he was uh, too surprised or disappointed when it didn't become an instant sensation. Uh, the other aspect of this piece that I find uh, fascinating, but that also proved problematic for audiences when they eventually did hear it, uh, and this is typical of Webern's music in general, is its extreme concision. So these are very, very short songs. Uh, the whole set lasts around four minutes or less. Um, so basically, when you're listening to it, you don't really have time uh, to figure out uh, where you've been, where you are presently, and where you're going. Everything just happens so quickly. Uh, it's as though if you, if you were to blink, you would just miss half the piece. So it really goes by in a flash. And uh, if you sort of imagine what a conventional concert would, would be like, if, you, if you're sitting there and you're hearing this piece and it goes by in three minutes and you have no idea what just happened, then, um, which unfortunately is often what happens, uh, then it's going to be very difficult for you to understand how this music works. And uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to try to tease out its, uh, the circumstances of its composition, its meaning, and then try to go back to it with fresh ears. Of course, uh, that basically presupposes that you can uh, have a recording at hand, that you can listen to it on, you know, multiple times, and none of this would have been possible in 1925. So, uh, I mean, God only knows what the effect would have been had this piece been played in a, in a concert at that time. Um, sort of, you're guaranteed to generate instant confusion and pandemonium. Uh, so, let's move on here. Now, I mentioned earlier that the instruments call to mind a kind of folk music quality. Now, it's interesting to have a look at the text in the light of that. Um, Webern was, uh, was known for admiring this kind of sweetly naive uh, folk poetry, which he returned to again and again in his vocal music throughout his career. Um, and this piece is actually based on an Austrian folk poem, so we don't really know who wrote it. And it's got a very simple, folksy, kind of direct, uh, um, expressive aspect to it. It's written in a kind of, uh, a kind of rural dialect of, uh, of German. And uh, so let's uh, have a look at this text. Little sweetheart, you mustn't be sad. Before the year is out, you'll be mine. Before the year is out, the rosemary will be green. The priest will say aloud, take each other. When the rosemary will be green, the bunch of myrtle will be green, and the carnation will blossom at home. So very, very simple. It refers to love. It refers to nature. Um, and it's, it's just so incredibly interesting that Webern would choose a text that sort of calls for a very direct kind of conversational expression, and then subjects it to the most extremely bizarre musical setting you could possibly imagine. And 
it's not clear to me that he would have necessarily seen any contradiction in doing that. So let's talk about how he actually went about setting this to music. Uh, Webern uh, started using the 12-tone technique not long after Schoenberg invented it in 1921. He started uh, explaining it to his pupils uh, in 1923, and uh, Webern more or less immediately started experimenting with it. And this particular piece is one of the earliest uses of the technique in Webern's music. That being said, uh, he uses it in a very peculiar way in this piece, a very rudimentary way. He hadn't quite figured out exactly how this technique could be used um, in a flexible way. So in this particular piece, he takes the, the, uh, the chromatic scale, the 12 notes of the, of the chromatic scale, uh, puts them in a fixed order, and then sort of reels them off again and again and again. So uh, Schoenberg and, uh, and later pieces by, by Webern make a somewhat more uh, elaborate use of this system by incorporating transpositions, retrogrades, inversions, and so on, but there's none of this in this piece. You simply have the same sequence of pitches repeated again and again and again, uh, but in constantly varying configurations and different octave placements as well. Um, one of the uh, results of the 12-tone technique is that it essentially abolishes any possible hierarchy between the pitches. So whereas in modal music or tonal music or pretty much any sort of music you could have imagined up to this point, there, there is always basically a primary note of some kind, there is a hierarchy of how you would uh, lay them out, and uh, there were certain grammatical uh, uh, functions of these, of these notes that would determine uh, how you would use them and the sorts of ways that you would resolve dissonances as well. Well, the 12-tone technique basically does away with all of that and uh, basically uh, abolishes any uh, sense of there being uh, a primary pitch. And part of the way that it does this is that, according to the technique of 12-tone composition that Schoenberg laid out, uh, you don't repeat a pitch until all 12 have been heard. So that means that there's very, very little pitch repetition in this music. There's very little structural redundancy. Uh, you don't really hear it functioning as you hear the piece because uh, a collection of, of 12 chromatic pitches is an extremely difficult thing to hold in your memory for a professional musician, let alone for someone who is simply uh, a concert goer. So there is basically zero chance that you will be able to uh, figure out what's going on in a technical, from a technical point of view in this piece. But really, there's no reason why you should, and there's no reason why you should particularly care. And I think that uh, analysts tend to, when they, when they talk about this kind of music, they tend to look at how it's made and spend a great deal of time explaining that. Um, but how it's made actually has very little uh, effect on our actual perception. And I think it's interesting to look at pieces like this sort of phenomenologically. So you don't look at how they're made so much, but you look at what the actual result is of the technique. And one of the results of this technique uh, is that you have a sort of a sense of listening to a kind of permanent explosion where the piece is constantly moving, it's constantly changing and, and turning into something else at, at, at all times, basically. And because there is so little repetition, there's, there's nothing to, to hold on to. So it's like you're in the middle of this extremely rapidly condensing world that's sort of caught on fire somehow. And it's, uh, it can be extremely, uh, extremely exciting, extremely interesting and exotic to listen to. But if you go at it listening, at basically looking for uh, conventional development strategies or themes that you can recognize and so on, um, then that's not going to happen. So that's part of the reason why uh, a lot of audiences have found this music so challenging. Um, just to give a sort of background to the expressive world of uh, these composers and to the sorts of music they were, they were writing at the time, I think it would be illuminating to look at a letter that Schoenberg wrote to Musoni around this time. So Schoenberg writes, Harmony is expression and nothing else. Away with pathos, away with protracted ten-ton scores. My music must be brief, concise, in two notes, not built, but expressed. In the results I wish for, no stylized and sterile protracted emotion. People are not like that. It is impossible for a person to have only one sensation at a time. One has thousands simultaneously, and this variegation, this multifariousness, 
This illogicality, which our senses demonstrate, the illogically presented by their interactions, set forth by some mounting rush of blood, by some reaction of the senses or the nerves, this I should like to have in my music. So interestingly, what he seems to be saying is that this is actually a more accurate depiction of how people actually think, feel, and perceive, uh, in the sense that we don't sort of receive information in an ordered, um, clear, logical way. We receive all sorts of sensations simultaneously, and uh, so the, the twelve-tone music has a, a vaguely kind of a, a psychedelic aspect to it in the sense that the, the filter is off. You're not going to have your attention focused on one thing for long enough for it to manifest as an object. Instead, you're going to be sort of having this uh, this extremely uh, complex experience in which you cannot possibly apprehend and uh, and categorize and uh, and uh, sort of filter through the the different uh, strands of it in the way that you normally would when listening to a piece of music. So let's just have a quick look at the the actual. 12-tone row that Webern uses in this piece. I don't want to spend too much time on it simply because um, it's completely irrelevant to what you actually hear when you are listening to the piece. You're not going to be able to remember this tone row. You're not going to be able to recognize it when it's used in the piece, partly because of the way Webern actually uses it. But just to give you an idea of what it is and um, what this sort of abstract entity uh, were to sound like if we were to isolate it, I'm going to just play it. Okay, so not the most thrilling thing, but this is the sort of raw material that Webern uh, began with when he was composing this piece. So let's have a look at how it, that actually functions. So um, we have three instruments, and each one is playing a sort of rather individual sol soloistic kind of music. Um, so one might think uh, that each instrument is sort of independently reeling off the 12 notes of this tone row, but in fact that's not at all what's happening. And um, instead of thinking of it in terms of linear lines, uh, Webern has sort of distributed these pitches um, up amongst the three instruments uh, so that we have basically a, a field of notes, but not a linear succession, succession of pitches the way you might expect. So. Um, the first note of the tone row is a C natural, and that appears in the guitar, as do the second and third pitches, which are B natural and F natural. Uh, for the fourth pitch, we jump up to the E flat clarinet, the G sharp, and then back down to the guitar again, the fifth note being B flat. Um, and then the sixth note is also on the guitar, a, uh, a natural, and then we go back to the the E flat clarinet for the seventh pitch, which is a D sharp. And then uh, the eighth pitch is also on the clarinet, and then for the ninth, we jump up to the soprano, who starts on a C sharp. The tenth and eleventh pitches are heard as a dyad, uh, a two note chord on the guitar, so that's D natural and G natural. And then for the twelfth and final pitch of the series, we end up uh, on the soprano. So what's interesting about that is the if you just look at the soprano line in isolation, you have uh, C-sharp and F-sharp. Those two pitches are not adjacent pitches in the tone row. They are just two pitches that have been plucked out of it and then placed in that particular configuration on the soprano. And you have to hear all the parts together to um, have a complete picture of the 12-note row in this case. Um, Nevertheless, there is a very small degree of repetition in the sense that the in the uh, F sharp and the C sharp F sharp of the soprano is repeated immediately afterwards, and in fact uh, overlaps somewhat with the second uh, sort of unspooling of the of the uh, the twelve tone row. Uh, one interesting way of perhaps conceptualizing and thinking about this technique is um, basically it's as, it's as though you had a jug filled with the twelve chromatic pitches and you sort of spilled it out, and once the jug was empty, you would fill it up again and spill it out again. And there's a kind of uh, constant uh, 
exhaustion of the 12 pitches and once that's accomplished then you you start again that's pretty much how this piece functions and because of the fact that the uh, the different pitches of the row are, are divided up and I mean, nobody listens that way and you don't really hear this music harmonically you don't hear the the G sharp and the clarinet and the uh, against the B flat and the, and the guitar and, and think of it in terms of a harmonic relationship really you actually just hear separate lines that are superimposed so the uh, the row itself is already completely dispersed and atomized and you're not really going to hear it and it doesn't matter again that you that you should hear it it's not it's not important what's important is the the overall texture and the overall surface of the music that's generated so um, now that we've heard the the 12 pitches vagrant starts again and uh, this time the uh, the C is once again in the guitar part but it's an octave higher so um, he can change the registers around as much as he wants from one repetition to the next the second pitch is this time heard on the soprano, uh, the third and fourth on the E-flat clarinet, the fifth is in the soprano, and the sixth goes back to the clarinet. So it's again, it's a very much the same sort of thing as what we saw previously. And this basically continues throughout the piece. So you just have these little uh, fields of, uh, of pitches, and, um, and once it's exhausted, you start again. And there's really no way to determine uh, when you're listening to this piece, what the identity of the different lines is, because um, they're they're just completely um, tied up with each other, basically. Um, so, for example, if you look at the soprano part and the clarinet part, the writing is basically the same. There's very little uh, to separate one from the other, which is extremely unusual, to say the least. I mean, normally you would write for a voice uh, in a rather different way than you would write for um, a clarinet or a, or a guitar, but the, the types of figurations and the types of uh, uh, lines that are being given to each instrument are strikingly similar. So that's a, a sort of rough overview of this particular composition. I'll be doing others, and um, I would recommend highly that you have a listen to the actual piece because nothing can replace that. And hopefully this uh, the video will have uh, explained some of the aspects of how and why uh, Weber wrote this particular piece.